Hello? Elements, challenges, benefits, and lessons learned uh, by those who are presenting. Um, this was developed uh, at Michigan State University um, with a group of Pequa uh, researchers, including myself. I'm Mike Leahy, uh, Su Kyung P, Gina Chun, Palau Rukmez, and Alicia Strain also worked on this presentation. I want them give them credit for that. As you can see, the uh, agenda for today's workshop is rather full. Um, what we really want to do is give you some background uh, on PE and quality assurance. Uh, including some definitions, uh, then talk uh, very specifically about why PE and QA are needed within our uh, rehabilitation counseling and re public rehabilitation programs. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to conduct uh, PE and QA, uh, spend some time talking about key elements and considerations in evaluation, and then talk specifically about some barriers and challenges that we all face in designing and maintaining effective uh, evaluation systems. Uh, finally, we'll, we'll be very specific again about how to use PE and quality assurance findings and end up with an, a, a, an application uh, called Project Excellence, where the Michigan State University has worked with uh, Michigan Rehab Services, our public agency, for the last 18 years on evaluation and talk a little bit about what we've learned. This slide shows a uh, Paul from 1967 and his uh, long-standing question in psychology about what types of interventions or services appear to work best with what specific populations under what specific conditions. I think no one could argue the importance of this question as we deliver services and interventions for people with disabilities. But as you know, we have a long way to go. We've got a good beginning in terms of evidence-based practice, but there are still many questions still undecided in relation to the effectiveness and reliability of the interventions that we um, provide to the individual customers that we serve. So now we're going to talk a little bit about background and we'll go over some materials that will set the foundation for the rest of the workshop. There's no question about the trends that we have been seeing over the last couple decades regarding increased accountability for our efforts in voc rehab delivery systems. Osborne and, and Gabler in 1992 posted this uh, statement about accountability that's really quite true. Uh, let me just review that with you. What gets measured gets done. If you don't measure results, you can't tell success from failure. If you can't see success, you can't reward it. If you can't reward success, you're probably rewarding failure. If you see success, you can't learn from it. If you can't recognize failure, you can't correct it. And if you can demonstrate results, you can win public support. In terms of background, the public VR program has for many decades produced outcome data on closed cases. In the private sector, we've also seen uh, CARF as an accrediting body of private uh, rehabilitation organizations require uh, for accreditation that program evaluation not only exist and is uh, active within the organization, but that there's real use of those data uh, for decisions about policy and practice that improve uh, the services provided. Uh, as this slide indicates, the Commission on Accreditation of Rehab Facilities was really one of the first to talk very specifically about program evaluation and its uses. In 1973, uh, this, the public program's emphasis in program eval was even strengthened as we mandated uh, programs to gather and analyze data on the effectiveness of services provided to citizens with disabilities in order to access the impact of these services within each state vocational rehabilitation agency. A focus on program evaluation and quality assurance was further strengthened in the public program with the 92 and 98 amendments. Uh, here we established some specific indicators and targeted performance expectations for all state agencies. In addition, CARF also moved ahead in the nonprofit arena of their requirements for PE and making sure that all those accreditation standards related to that are met before accreditation is provided. Uh, we shifted the focus from the design of the programs uh, in relation to collection of 
data analysis and reporting to the impact these data have on providing services in relation to continuous improvement. And as you can see at the bottom of that slide, we have quality assurance systems or plans, evidence-based practice, and knowledge translation as all integral aspects of both PE and QA. Furthering this trend for increased accountability, we've seen now within NIDLER, our National Research uh, Institute for Disability and Rehabilitation, um, has really highly emphasized the need for developing additional knowledge about best practice and evidence-based practices that we utilize within our public domain. They're really calling for research studies to meet the standards for inclusion in evidence-based systematic reviews. In addition, the Rehab Act Amendments of 214 also stipulated performance accounting measures through Section 116 for all core employment service agencies. Now let's take a look at some of the definitions of program evaluation and quality assurance and note some of the differences and distinctions of each. So on this slide we can see there's a number of, of definitions uh, of PE provided uh, from different kinds of organizations and disciplines. Uh, my preferred definition on this page would be the latter one uh, done by the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It really fits, I think, more clearly the, the scope of what we're trying to do. And um, this is, is, is laid out here as a systematic method for collecting, analyzing, and using data to examine the effectiveness and efficiency of programs and, as, as importantly, to contribute to continuous improvement of program. Quality assurance also has a number of definitions here as well. Uh, here again, I like the third definition the best, uh, which includes all planned and systematic activities implemented within the quality system that can be demonstrated to provide confidence that a product or service, in this case, will fulfill the requirements for quality. This slide demonstrates some of the differences between PE and QA that we need to be aware of. However, as we indicated earlier, um, these differences really arise from their origins. They differ in perspective, not intent. QA came out of the marketplace, uh, where competition stimulates innovation, where PE, as it's experienced in rehabilitation, came from the government, where legislation was promoting compliance. PE is cyclical in nature uh, and, and rather than developmental, where PE tends to focus on scientific methodologies more than QA does. So as you can see, the, the PE, QA, and research um, figure at the bottom right of the slide really shows the relationship between all of these particular domains. This slide shows some differences between research and PE. There, there certainly are differences and distinctions to note. On the research side, we're usually engaging in research to seek knowledge, generate new knowledge. We're in evaluation, we're trying to develop uh, key information that will allow decision makers to make wise and informed decisions. On the research side, it's really researcher focused where evaluation is stakeholder focused. On the research side, we're really looking at hypotheses. And uh, on the evalu evaluation side, we're typically targeting very key questions that we need answered in order to improve services. They both have methods that they utilize that are very similar. Uh, in research, we're making recommendations. However, in evaluation, we're rec making recommendations based on the qu key questions to the stakeholders. In this next section, we're just going to talk a little bit about why PE and QA are needed. As you can see, there are multifaceted purposes for evaluation and quality assurance. And let's just review these real briefly. Uh, certainly one of the most important things is that it provides a comprehensive system to demonstrate accountability and move forward in relation to continuous improvement. It also leads to more accurate and informed decisions driven by data. It adds to our existing knowledge in the human service field about what works and what does not work in the kind of program that you've designed. 
It also monitors and assesses performance over time, so you're constantly getting feedback in relation to your desired performance in relation to goals that you've set. It also identifies and analyzes problems and helps you generate solutions. And finally, it really shows your funding sources and the community in general how effective your program works and how it benefits the program participants. These next few slides try to look at different kinds of program evaluations, different purposes, um, and, and different um, motivations for in getting involved with PE. Uh, two of the ones that you're very familiar with, I'm sure, is formative evaluation and summative evaluation. Formative is typically uh, is set up for improvement, where summative evaluation really has a focus on accountability, uh, following the delivery of a service or completion of a program, uh, summative evaluation provides the overall judgment of the value of that service to the outcome. On this slide, you can also see that there are different points in time where the assessment is provided in terms of pre-PE. Uh, here would be the distinction between process evaluation and outcome evaluation. Both of these areas are significant in the VR area so that we get um, a real look at um, how things are progressing before the clients exit the program. A good example here would be the, the trying to look at satisfaction as not only an outcome but as something that we can measure during the client's progress through their individual plan. Outcome evaluation we are all very familiar with and that's looking at the overall impact of the interventions and services provided in relation to the overall outcome the client achieved. There's also different types of program evaluations relative to the kind of impact you're trying to do. Economic impact really investigates what resources were used in the program and the cost benefit of that or return on investment of those services in relation to the achievement of successful outcomes. Impact evaluation measures the degree to which the program meets ultimate goals and provides evidence for use in policy and funding decisions. It focuses on long-term sustained changes as a result of program activities, both positive or negative, and intended or unintended consequences are utilized in the analysis. So slide 19 really shows you a, a continuum of the types of program evaluation, um, starting at the, the far left with more formative, subjective, kinds of evaluation. Uh, in the middle you've got your process evaluation where you're really looking at, at impact during the time that services are being delivered. And finally the summative or more objective evaluation at the end which typically has a more rigorous design, lots of data collection and analysis, reporting and dissemination of results. In this next section we're going to talk specifically about various PE and QA models that are in use today in a variety of settings. It is true you can use most of the research methods for your program evaluation. Uh, if you want to identify cause and effect relationships of your program, you can design a true experimental study by employing an intervention, random assignment, and control group. However, it's often very difficult to implement as it requires more effort and resources. In the field of vocational rehabilitation, there's an additional ethical consideration in terms of group assignment that often make these experimental designs um, not appropriate. In addition, in the human service field, certain results cannot be explained by a linear relationship by ignoring the context of the program and environment. Therefore, instead of presenting traditional research designs that could be used for your program evaluation, I'm going to introduce several models that are commonly used by program evaluators. The first model that we will take a look at is the logic model. Many of you are very familiar with this model, but I do want to go over it just somewhat so that we cover this in, in terms of all models that are available to you. Uh, a logic model is a systematic and visual way to present and share your understanding of the relationship among the resources you have to operate your program the activities you plan, and the changes or results you hope to achieve. The purpose of the logic model is to provide stakeholders with a roadmap describing sequences of related events connecting the need for the planned program with the program's desired results. 
Also, one can use the logic model throughout the program. It helps organize and systematize program planning, management, and evaluation functions. Uh, this particular uh, slide uh, shows descriptively how these different inputs, outputs, and outcome impacts are measured and how this kind of a uh, model is typically set up. The next model that we'll take a look at uh, is the Plan, Do, Check, Act model, or PDCA. Uh, this was uh, popularized by Dr. Edwards Deming, who is often considered the father of the father of modern quality control. Deming's theory has formed the basis for total quality management, which, which I'm sure you are all aware of. The model is implemented to improve the quality and effectiveness of processes with the product lifestyle, life cycle management, project management, and human resource management in many other areas of business. TQM processes are often divided into four sequential categories, plan, do, check, and act. As you can see below here, there are a number of benefits and challenges related to the use of the PDCA. Well, in terms of benefit, it applies to all levels of an organization. It's adaptable to various situations. It stresses user empowerment, learning, and growth and advanced skills are not required to utilize it. It is, however, challenged by no prescribed way to apply the model, and it is data-driven, which requires some methodological skills. The PDCA model, as described here, uh, is another uh, visual to help you see how this, these various four areas work together in a sequential process. Utilization-focused evaluation is the model that we'll discuss next. Um, the utilization-focused evaluation, or UFE, was developed by Patton. It's an approach based on the principle that an evaluation should be judged on its usefulness to its intended users. Therefore, evaluation should be planned and conducted in ways that enhance the likely utilization of both the findings and the uh, process itself to inform decisions and improve performance. US, UFE has two essential elements. First, the primary intended user of the evaluation must be clearly identified and personally engaged at the beginning of the evaluation process. Secondly, evaluators must ensure that these intended users of evaluation by the primary intended user guide all decisions that are made about the evaluation process. Rather than focusing on general and abstract users and uses, U UFE is focused on real and specific users and uses. The evaluator's job is to make decisions independently of intended users, is not to make decisions independently of intended users, but rather to facilitate the decision making amongst people who will use the findings of the evaluation. This has been a, a type of model that's been used in a lot of programs, and it's one that we really like as well here at Michigan State University. Uh, one of the things that we're very aware of in, in all of our uh, dealings with program evaluation is that unless the very top of the organization is committed to the utilization of those results, uh, the system does not work as well as it should. Everybody has to be engaged. Everybody has to, be un has to understand the value and benefit of the kind of information they're getting um, to really have a very successful program. The UF model has obvious benefits and challenges. Uh, it's a, it's US, UFE is a very good cultural fit for the rehabilitation profession. Uh, it makes sense to counselors in the field, promotes buy-in, and takes advantage of existing skills that they already have. Challenges are UFE is limited in scope. Its qualitative and real relativistic nature of the process makes it difficult to quantify and standardize. UFE's approach is challenged by user turnover, and evaluators rely heavily on the information from stakeholders on intended use. This figure also shows just the, the sequential nature of the process itself. Again, it's a very logical flow and fits really well, and really can be utilized with other models as well, so that you have the buy-in of intended users and that kind of input and expectation, but you may be using some key elements from other models in terms of the actual methodological process. The next few slides uh, really were developed by Patton in 2012 
uh, to revise the approach of the use of the UF model. Uh, there's 17 steps that are laid out, and I'll let you just go through those independently. They speak for themselves. The next model that we will discuss will be the SIP model, which uh, stands for Context, Inputs, Processes, and Products. Uh, you might be very familiar with this model. The SIP model uh, of program evaluation is a model which was developed by Daniel Stuffelbeam and colleagues in the 1960s. SIP is a decision-focused approach to evaluation and emphasizes the systematic provision of information for program management and total operation. Its elements share labels uh, very familiar with the logic model that we've covered already, but the SIP model is not hampered by the assumption of linear relationships that constrain the logic model. An evaluator who understands a program in terms of elements, complex dynamics, and nonlinear relationship will find the SIP model a much more powerful approach to evaluation. As you can see, these definitions on the slide laid out to talk about what context, input, process, and product mean, but the benefits are really important. They're guided by ethical and professional principles and empowering impact on the stakeholders. Uh, this model is also challenged by its complexity and training and research expertise is necessary to live up to the explicit standards of the model. Applications of the SIP model, and you can see a very wide variety of groups that are engaged in this. The next model that we'll talk about is the input intervention output model. Now this is a model that is very familiar with many program evaluators throughout the country and one that is used extensively, uh, particularly in relation to the 9-11 data and other uh, available information within the Public Rehabilitation Counseling Program. More quantitative and longitudinal variant of the input process and products model introduced within the SIP. Benefits include providing a very useful framework to organize variables for display. It also guides the analysis in terms of outcomes, particularly in relation to large data sets, which we often utilize within the state federal program. Challenges are it only focuses on the organizational system. It allows for descriptive research on correlations but obviously no causal relationship can be included. As you can see here, the application of input intervention output model uh, in relation to the 9-11 data, where we have our input process variables and finally our outcome variables organized by individual. Slide 37 really relates to the application um, of the model itself. And here is what we've laid out input variables that I'm sure are very familiar with all of you. These would be the demographic and background data that you would collect at, at the very beginning of the process with the individual customer. Uh, the next slide, 38, talks about the process variables that are involved typically within the 9-11 data. And these would be all the interventions and services that were provided to the individual customer. Finally, the outcome variables in terms of type of closure um, and other information that, that further um, quantify that outcome are provided. Overall, this becomes a model that is very easy to understand and it fits well within the kind of process we utilize where we're gathering all the information available on the client, looking at all the interventions and services that were provided, and then trying to look at their outcomes in terms of what seemed to work, what contributed to the success or failure of that particular customer. Now we want to move ahead in the workshop to really look at key elements and considerations when designing and maintaining an effective program evaluation system. In this figure, figure all the uh, relevant key elements of program evaluation are laid out for you. As you can see, they're all connected and uh, all depend on each other for success. Let's take a look at the evaluation culture element first. Evaluation culture really is extremely important in having a successful program uh, sustain its value over time. Uh, we're talking about creating an environment for self-examination, learning through experimentation, 
in the use of data-driven policy and practices at all levels of the organization. We're really interested in developing innovation and adherence to core institutional values. One of the clear challenges in today's rehabilitation environment is to develop and maintain this kind of evaluation culture uh, at all levels of the organization. The second element is really the demand for data quality and data integrity. As data is collected throughout the organization at different levels, uh, one has to have confidence that those data are accurately um, inputted. Um, here is where you'd have to have some real time with counselors in the field, uh, as well as managers and supervisors, so they understand how this data is created, what judgments are made by the counselor in relation to filling out these kinds of requests. And unless the data is accurate, you really don't have a system. You just have some, some data, which really has no meaning. So this is an extremely important aspect of the PE system itself and worthwhile to spend additional time on so that your counselors in the field not only understand why the data is collected, but its importance and value in the entire uh, process of making policy and practice decisions. These are the three remaining elements of a PE system. Uh, obviously, analytic experience and collaborative partnerships are extremely important in developing a quality system. Um, all individuals are responsible for program evaluation and should receive the level of training and support required to accomplish the task and to ensure that the results are systematic, credible, and objective. Leadership responsibilities can't be underscored more. It's absolutely critical for the leadership of the organization to demonstrate the value and benefit of these data in making decisions. Obviously, the most important aspect of this in terms of an element is the use of the data for continuous improvement, which is what these systems are all about. In these next few slides, I have displayed some uh, information that Patton uh, added to our literature in 2012 in terms of the logic and values of evaluative thinking. And I'll go through these very quickly, but they make sense. They're very reasonable kinds of expectations that one must have. We need to be clear. We need to be specific. We need to focus our, and prioritize our efforts, and we need to be systematic in our approach. Continuing with these um, evaluative thinking aspects that Patton has put together, we need to operationalize program concepts, ideas, and goals, and really spend time carefully describing that. We make assumptions explicit in our process. We distinguish inputs and processes from outcomes. Confusing processes with outcomes is common. We need to provide empirical support and logical explanations for our conclusions. We need to make criteria and standards for judgments explicit. And we separate database statements from fact, of fact, from interpretation and judgments. And that we limit generalizations and causal explanations to what the data support. So we really have to be careful that we're not going beyond the data in making conclusions. We need to really stick to what the data is telling us in relation to evaluative thinking. The next section of the workshop will deal with, deal with barriers and challenges. Now these are areas we're all somewhat familiar with, but let's go ahead and review these anyway. We start to see some of these challenges laid out. These were principally gathered by Patton in 2001 and modified somewhat to fit our vocational rehabilitation system. Uh, rehabilitation process involves both personal and environmental factors and their interactions, which make it difficult to determine which aspects of the service delivery affect which outcome. This has been one of the most difficult problems that we face in evaluation. And going back to Paul's original statement of, of really identifying what interventions work under what pop, what conditions, uh, those questions are difficult to respond to because of their complexity in our field, but we're developing newer ways of going about things, and I think we've got some really um, good data now to share relative to the practices that we provide and the interventions that are part of that and how effective they may be with different populations. One of the other 
barriers and challenges that we have is our failure to integrate evaluation with other major organizational processes like planning and budgeting. It really deserves its place at the table. This is the data that really demonstrates the effectiveness and efficiency of our services and has policy and practice implications. Having inadequate resources to support meaningful evaluation is a clear barrier in many situations. You have to do what is best and, and provide as much support as possible. But it is understood that evaluation, uh, the funding of evaluation efforts is typically below what is needed. Finally on this slide, defining evaluation as paperwork and external reporting process rather than organizational development and learning opportunity. This goes back to really the culture of how we think about evaluation. If we think about it as just a task that needs to be done, paper that needs to be completed, uh, we're going to fall short of the potential value of this information in our decision-making processes and it is our continuous improvement. Continuing with some of the barriers, feeling that evaluation will reveal flaws to the larger world is oftentimes uh, something that we see in our agencies. Um, at the counselor level in particular, there may be some misunderstanding of how the data is used and somewhat hesitant to provide the kind of input that would really help modify or benefit the situation. So another one is failing to clearly and explicitly specify the intended use of an evaluation and studies uh, for intended users is really a mistake. We really need to be very open with the, our uh, organizations that we work with in relation to how we're going about gathering data, how they're going to be involved in the process, and how that data is going to be utilized and what feedback they will get in the future. Conducting evaluations without meaningful involvement of the primary intended users is a real mistake. In the next few slides, we'll be talking about how we utilize PE and quality assurance findings in our agencies. The utilization of results uh, in relation to continuous improvement really have a variety of aspects to that. Uh, direct instrumental utilization is the use of evaluation findings by a decision maker and other stakeholders. Uh, and this is really what we see uh, as, as the primary focus of what we're doing in program evaluation. Uh, conceptual utilization is another aspect. The use of evaluation results to influence thinking about issues in general. And certainly the latter utilization principle of persuasion, the use of evaluation results to either support or negate a particular position or an issue. This slide uh, by Rossi in 2004 just shows how evaluation utilization is impacted by these various aspects that we've talked about. Here in our own area, the goal of vocational rehabilitation really is direct and conceptual utilization of evaluation results. And this assists agencies and organizations to make continuous improvement and creative innovations in the service that they offer to their customers. In the final section of this workshop, we really want to provide you with a, a specific application of some of the material that we've been talking about so far um, and to talk to you a little bit about the development of Project Excellence. This was developed in uh, 2001 as a unique grant-funded program evaluation partnership between the Office of Rehabilitation and Disability Studies at Michigan State and Michigan Rehabilitation Services in the state of Michigan. The goal was very explicit and it was Project Excellence was designed to provide long-term stability to the existing program evaluation functions of the agency, as well as expanded capacity to address critical evaluation and research questions so that the Bureau can obtain additional qualitative and quantitative data and analysis regarding the impact of vocational rehabilitation services on Michigan residents with disabilities. The key to success in this long-standing relationship between Michigan State University and Michigan Rehab Services really has been how we have defined this through a collaborative approach. Uh, during the last 16 years, we've used a variety of evaluation projects that have been conducted, including core projects like the RSA Standards and Performance Indicators, Return on Investment, RSA 9-11 Data Analysis, Customer Satisfaction Surveys, uh, comprehensive statewide needs assessment and other projects either requested by MRS 
uh, in relation to their goals and priority areas or proposed by MSU in relation to data integrity. We also find that the implementation of the data and recommendations provided by Project Excellence has been carefully thought out in terms of how you engage the community and particularly to have the program evaluators there to really help translate that knowledge into practice or policy for the agency. You can see the, the steps laid out in terms of the kinds of services that the program evaluation uh, office at MSU provides MRS through Project Excellence. You can see that that continuum starts with emergence of issues, uh, some pre-investigation work, developing evaluation designs, followed by data collection and analysis, and then very importantly, the communication of findings to the personnel, counselors, supervisors, and administrators, and then to finally move forward with actions in relation to policy or practice changes or implementation of a particular program under review. It demonstrates the, uh, the kinds of projects that we've been working on through Project Excellence um, and put those into a kind of a, a process that we have. I'm sure many of these types of projects are ones that you, your own state agency, is working on continuously. There has been a, a great deal of benefit um, for both MRS and MSU in relation to this funded partnership. For MRS, the expanded programmatic research and PE capacity to meet routine regulatory reporting requirements has been greatly enhanced. Program evaluation is used as a major component of the agency's continuous improvement strategy. At MSU, it's been extremely valuable to us. It's an opportunity to provide a rich, real-world, field-based environment to enhance the training of doctoral students in research and program evaluation and provides a unique revenue stream to fund doctoral students as research, research assistants. We've really learned a lot through our work with MRS in program evaluation. Um, we, we understand the importance of, of an organization being a, learn, being a learning organization with common values. Uh, creative leadership and management styles to address implementation of findings from Project Excellence and make continuous improvements has been absolutely essential. A common goal throughout the organization to improve service delivery and enhance employment outcomes has been made very clear by administrators and the program evaluation uh, personnel from MSU have provided the kind of information and data to help make that happen. One of the things we are really pleased about is the use of the data that we've developed to guide decision making and policy development at all levels of the organization. We want everybody within the organization to understand what project excellence is, what program evaluation can provide them in relation to benefit and information. And we've made some great strides forward in that particular endeavor. We also now have the ability to continuously evaluate innovations in service to lead interventions leading to evidence-based practice. Here we're taking a much more proactive stance rather than just measuring things after the fact. We're really setting up designs so that we can measure new innovations in programs and have that impact data available to everyone as they make decisions about furthering the um, implementation of the particular project. And finally, beyond compliance issues, which we usually talk a lot about, PE allows the organization to inform the community about their success and performance. And this is ultimately important, not only to uh, st typical stakeholders in the process, but to the general public as well. The remainder of the workshop is laying out uh, additional uh, models for you to utilize or take a look at and potentially uh, use in the future. Um, these were the models that we reviewed carefully and laid out for you, but are not ones that we felt we needed to take additional time on. Toward the end of the uh, workshop, you'll also find a number of helpful things, including our reference section in relation to the literature that we utilized to prepare this workshop. Thank you for um, participating in this PQA workshop on program evaluation and quality assurance. I hope that it has been helpful to some, in some regard in terms of uh, further identifying the need 
and value of program evaluation and quality assurance and giving you some ideas about possible models that you could employ within your own agency in order to get data that you can trust that allows you to make informed decisions about practice and policy. I wish you the best in your efforts to continue to make progress in this area. Obviously, it goes way beyond compliance and gets into the real identification of those services which appear to be most effective under certain conditions with specific populations. That is when we're making some real progress on evidence-based practice, which can really guide the interventions our counselors select for the optimal outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And um, they'll be just briefly showing this whole couple of things. Uh, the Again, the recording is being recorded. Uh, the recording. The webinar has been recorded, as well as the slide deck will be available on the PEQA site as we pull together also the captioning, transcript, and the answers to all the questions that have been developed. At this stage, I'm going to turn the session over to Heidi Decker-Mauer, who will uh, manage the uh, questions and answers that all of you have been submitting. So, uh, Heidi, you're up. Hi, Terry. Thanks for handing it over. Um, it's looking like we don't have any questions besides the technical questions we had during uh, the webinar. Um, we have Supi on um, on the video, and I was wondering, Sue, did you have anything else that you'd like to explain a little bit further or talk about um, in regards to the presentation we just saw? Well, uh, this is Mike Leahy, who so just passed it oh, off. Hi, Mike. <laughs> uh, hi. Not probably not more information because we we loaded that. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, but just <laughs> encouraging people. To really, yeah, just encouraging people to really take a look at options that they may have and how they best fit within their own organization. Uh, you, you know, there's obviously great similarity among state agencies, but the the cultures are different and the atmospheres are different. And people really have to think through that as they design how PE should operate within their own agency. So we hopefully we gave you some options to think about. Um, the lessons that we learned, I think, were probably most important. Um, they're things that we rely on in order to do a really good job for our own state agency here in Michigan. Uh, and we're always trying to improve that. So it's an ongoing process, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And you know, you you just mentioned Mike um, about culture, and uh, it seems like that's one of those things that's a little bit more difficult for organizations to kind of wrap their heads around, and that sometimes seems to be a very slow boat to turn. Yeah. Do you have any examples um, in your past experience that that um, showed how people were able to kind of turn their culture around? Um, any any great breakthroughs or or yeah, any examples of that? Yeah, it's a tough question, but yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of different things. I used Small to do, softballs for you, Mike. <laughs> I've done a used to do a continuing education workshops for rehabilitation organizations and help them design their own uh, program evaluation systems. I did that all over the United States, and it was a really good lesson in terms of how different cultures interact with PE. And that that one item I said earlier about the leadership, it's absolutely critical. I mean, the staff can do a wonderful job uh, designing and implementing a PE system, but unless they have the buy-in and real support from the leaders of the organization, it's going to be insufficient. Uh, so there's the, the key there, I think, is, is trying to get leaders really engaged in this at the beginning mm -hmm. so that they really understand what the value is of some of this data in terms of making the kinds of decisions on policy and practice that have to be made. So that, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge there is, is making sure that people understand the value, not looking at this process as simply compliance. Right, and that, that kind of goes along with the principle of, you know, when trying to convince leadership or kind of upsell or upmanage that idea, you really need to be able to show what's in it for the leadership. Um, that's right. Really, it's going to, to help um, the organization um, especially if that culture is supported, because um, I've heard the phrase, culture eats, structure 
for breakfast. So yeah. that's really a top down thing and making sure that if, if you're really enthusiastic and invested about an idea like this, if the staff is, is really in, um, sometimes being able to relate back to the leadership, how this is going to either um, help reach more people right. or um, you know what the, what the end outcomes are, because sometimes it's not always going to be evident to people um, in leadership how this is going to affect those numbers that everybody seems to be concerned about or um, you know the, the survey results that you get when when you're looking at uh, customer satisfaction so um, sometimes uh, just in in my background you kind of have to either show them the data or the dollars mm -hmm. or or let them know how it's going to help the, the organization um, come across as um, uh, more efficient or you know better customer service so sometimes it, it takes <clears throat> a little bit of convincing what's in it for me to make sure that yeah, it does it, th it does and in, in some yeah. cases Heidi the uh, you know the um, the uh, uh, data that's that's generated obviously typically comes from counselors in the field right and, and that's one of the things we put in there was this idea of data integrity Mm -hmm. And that's not to be a negative term. That's something that we utilized here by doing focus groups all over the state with counselors, looking at what they were entering into the system as uh, inputs and making sure they understood why those questions were being asked, why they had the input data, what the use of that data was and its value. And it was really uh, an eye-opening experience for all of us because most of the counselors really didn't understand the importance of it and didn't right. realize how it could affect the organization and in fact their own uh, caseloads. Right. So, so I think really taking time at the beginning, or if you're into a system already, revisiting the counselors out in the field, because if you don't get good data, you don't have a good system. And you right. have to have a sense of confidence that, that those folks are engaged as well. That's, that, that sounds like, that absolutely makes sense probably to all of us. Sometimes yeah. it's harder to, to upsell that yeah um, I don't I don't mean to sell it as an easy thing it is no no it takes some um, time. it's one of it's one of those things that you know you need to build up that narrative uh, for folks you know maybe people out in the field are, are collecting data but it doesn't really paint a story for them or tell them how it's going to help them um, you know help their caseloads or, or help them uh, help more uh, consumers. So sometimes people have to think beyond just looking at the numbers and see what those numbers are doing to actually what the practical applications of those numbers are in terms of helping with workload or helping with customer satisfaction or, you know, helping leadership, um, you know, look great with, with the great customer service um, reviews that they're getting or, you know, really, really help them because when you can show success and you can kind of, um, show people how it affect, affects them positively, then there usually is a lot more buy-in. But like you said, it's really hard to do. But some of those ideas of thinking a little bit harder about what, what the story the data tells is, right. that sometimes can help people visualize it a little bit more. Whereas yeah. I think sometimes numbers are difficult for people to um, just on their own translate into outcomes. That's so, right. That's right. And the, the other part of that, too, is, is not only the understanding of, of the potential value of the data and what they're inputting, but also uh, I think counselors need to see that actions are taken. Uh, right. Corrective actions or, or remediation or whatever uh, to really fix something in the system that is not working at optimal level. And if I think right. they see that continuous improvement along with an understanding generally about the value of the information they provide. Right. That's when you really start to have a dynamic system. Yeah, and you know, people are uh, people are adverse to change sometimes, so it's, <clears throat> it's right. really really hard to to get buy-in for that. Um, I actually did have a question come in, and it was um, regarding some of the ways that Wiowa is impacting Pequa. Um, is there a anything that you care to uh, kind of detail for us? in terms of that, just with what you're seeing out, out in the field and with the people that you're working with? Sure. Go ahead. Right. I think the, uh, I think the, it's not, uh, I think the nature of the question which may help a little bit is it's, 
it's not necessarily how it's affecting PQA tax, but how it's affecting program evaluation and quality assurance in general, I, I believe is what Steve's asking. So, yeah. so go ahead, Drew. Um, hi, this is Sue. Actually, I'm working at the um, for the product excellence as a um, project manager. Um, I think I mean there are several different things. Actually, you already know about it. So we are most primarily working based on the um, section the 116 for the real world. So actually, the performance accountability measure is really kind of the big thing. So um, right now, actually, the data has not been really kind of clearly set up, even though we have to change the 9.0.0 data. Um, so I think we are still actually the, in the process of the improving our the problem evaluation and the, uh, the quality assurance. Um, so yes, actually, it has been actually in the changes a lot of the process. But um, still, actually, we are um, working in progress for the um, yeah, it, real. It, yeah, it's the same model. We're still using the same model that we've always used. Uh, and when we work with people uh, that are engaging with PQA, uh, you know, it, it's, we're, we're learning right along with them in terms of how to best utilize uh, some of the new variables that are needing to be reported on and how to best get the, the, the information that is accurate and timely. Uh, so we're, we're, we're struggling a little bit too, uh, but we're right with you and we're going to figure this thing out so that it becomes a real smooth process and in the end we'll get better information and more usable information as a result. It looks like we have another question that came in. Thank, thanks you two for, for, the, um, for the answer to that question. Um, I think that sometimes uh, we all are figuring things out and sometimes it's good to hear that um, you know we're kind of all in this together and everybody is is working through some of those solutions um, the next question that I had was um, have you used any of these QA uh, PE approaches to develop DR provider scorecards ie quality outcome scores for providers is that something that that you two can speak to Oh, I don't think we have not provided that kind of the, the research yet, but I actually look at some of the other states, like the, I think when I was working in the New York state, and they usually actually have some vendors and then kind of based on the, um, their standard of the um, measurement, they use the, the um, evaluation for each vendor. But the right now, I mean, so far in PE, we have not used that method yet. All right, well, thank you for the answer. It takes me a minute to find my mic button every once in a while to unmute myself. So <laughs> there's a little bit of lag there. Uh, so that answers the questions that uh, we have in the question and answer box. All right. Are there any concluding remarks or anything that you'd like to add out there um, before we wrap it up? Uh, not really. Heidi? Oh, sorry, Heidi, one quick question and, and oh, then sure. maybe we can do that. Or I was just wondering, Mike and Sue, any suggestions on ways to present data based on your experience and maybe project, project excellence? Do tables work better, pie charts? line graphs, I know it's not a definitive, but do you have, based on your experience, sort of which method of presentation seems to work better, maybe at different times when you're presenting data? Yeah, that's a good question, Terry. The, um, it's all about who your audience is. And, uh, you know, there are some kinds of reports that we do that are pretty data-driven data and have a lot of different data in them. Uh, but we've always found that, that the visual uh, presentation of information is the easiest for most people to absorb quickly. Um, so we go to tables and pie charts and do all those things, uh, again, thinking that we want the data to be understood. Um, some of the other things we do in, in terms of other evaluation efforts, it's a little bit different, more research focused, and that becomes pretty, uh, pretty deep in terms of the uh, data that we do. But I would say making it visible, making it uh, clear and understandable that's that's got to be the 
the key driving force in presenting data. Isn't that interesting how it kind of comes down to, to communication and interpreting things into ways that are understandable across so many different audiences? That's, that's absolutely the key, Heidi. Isn't it? Um, it, it uh, I've run into that in several different instances where you have so many different audiences and you need to be able to hit on something that's relevant for all of them, but isn't so generalized that it doesn't, you know, actually tell the story. So oh, yeah. right. there's a challenge of dealing with multiple stakeholders, mul multiple audiences, multiple end users. So uh, that, that's always an interesting conundrum. As a communications person, I love that kind of stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> I understand how it's sure. really difficult to, <clears throat> to get great. that across in um, a great way. So I, I think it's time to begin wrapping up. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, Sue, both for the presentation and the QA. Uh, and as I noted, we will keep track of all the questions. We will keep track of all the answers. We will be posting that. What I'd like to do right now is turn it over to Jen uh, gunlock Klot, who will tell you about the evaluation and how to get your CRC credit. So Jen, why don't you uh, take us out? And when Jen's done, we will be done. So thanks, everybody. Sure. Um, an email is going out tomorrow to everyone that registered with information on how to access the archived version of this web webinar, along with a link to the evaluation where you can request the CRC if you choose to um, get one of those. And um, all of this will also be available on our website at pequotac.org. So thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar.